Okay, morning everyone. So we're in our series on relatable faith. And what that means is we're talking about the ordinary guys, right? The average Joes in the Bible, the people who are really relatable, who we could go like, oh yeah, that could be me in that story. And today we're talking about a guy called Ananias in Acts. And actually, there are three different guys called Ananias in Acts. The only three guys called Ananias in the New Testament, they're all in Acts. So let's just be clear first about who we're talking about, all right? So there's a guy called Ananias who's married to Sapphira. They live in Jerusalem. They're followers of Jesus, and they lied to God about the offering they brought, and they dropped down dead. It's not that one, okay? It's not that one we're talking about. There's a guy called Ananias. He's a high priest in Jerusalem. He's in Acts 23 and 24. And he's involved in Paul's arrest and imprisonment, which eventually leads to Paul's execution. It's not that one, okay? It's not that one. The third one, it is this guy. It's this guy called Ananias who lives in Damascus. He's in Acts 9, and he's mentioned um, in Acts 22 as well. And he has this encounter with Paul. So at the time, Saul, Paul is called Saul, same guy, okay? But at this point in the story that we're going to look at, he's called Saul. Um, And, yeah, Ananias has this encounter with Saul. So the name Ananias actually means Yahweh has been gracious. Now, remember that. That might be significant later, okay? Yahweh has been gracious. So let's read Acts 9, first of all. We're going to start from verse 9. Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples, He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus, who you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men travelling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind, and he didn't eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptised, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, actually, this is such a good story that they included it twice in Acts. We've got another account, which is Paul's account later on, when he's telling the story about what happened to him following his arrest in Jerusalem. So we'll just read that one as well, because it's slightly different. That's in Acts 22, and it starts at verse 6, and it's a bit shorter. It says, About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground, and I heard a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? I asked. 
I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord? I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus, because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. Then he said, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptised and wash your sins away, calling on his name. So that must be an important story, right, if they've included it twice. It's a bit like in the Gospels, some of the stories about Jesus are included more than once, aren't they? And then we know that they're really significant and we need to pay attention. So there's a lot we could say about this story if we were talking about Paul, Saul, Paul. If he was the focus of our attention this morning or the focus of our preaching series, there's lots of things we could focus on. Perhaps we would talk about how zealous he was for God, actually, Like, he thought that people talking about Jesus was blasphemy. He didn't believe that Jesus was the Messiah. So in his attempts to defend God from blasphemy, he had actually become the blasphemer, hadn't he? And he was on a mission to arrest all the Christians because he thought that they were spreading lies about God. So Acts 8 verse 3 says, Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. So that's what he did, but it's because he loved the Lord and he thought these people were spreading blasphemy. And we would probably talk about why God blinded him anyway. Like God stopped him in his tracks, didn't he? He wanted to get his attention and it demonstrated God's power and it really made Saul listen, didn't it? And then we might concentrate on that period of three days when he was blind, three days in utter darkness and he didn't eat or drink anything. He was hungry and thirsty and longing for the light. And not just physically, right, metaphorically and spiritually as well. He took that time, that three days, to consider his life and seek the Lord. But we're focusing on Ananias today. And actually, he's much more relatable, isn't he? Like, we won't all travel the world planting hundreds of churches, seeing hundreds of miracles and people saved and raising the dead. And Paul did write nearly half the New Testament, right? So sometimes he can be a little bit unrelatable. But with Ananias, he's just this average guy, an ordinary Christian like you and me. And there's this one act of obedience here, which is far more relatable for us. So here's the 10 second version of this sermon, right? Pray and obey. That's what Ananias does. He prays and he obeys. He did what God told him to do. But I think we've got a bit longer, haven't we, Chris? We've got a bit longer. So let's dig a little bit deeper. So today, I really want to concentrate on trust. Ananias trusted God, didn't he? And actually, this has been something we've been thinking about in in my house, in my family. It's been a hot topic. Because recently, one of our kids said to Paul, Daddy, I think I want to be a Christian, but I don't know if I can trust God. And it's something that we have to learn, isn't it? We learn to trust God. Do you know that you can trust God? So let's dig a little bit deeper. And the first thing we'll focus on is the fact that Ananias recognised God's voice. So this is about Ananias' prayer life, isn't it? He made time to listen and he recognised the voice of the Lord. So in the passage, you'll see that it said... Um, In Damascus, there was this disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. And immediately, Ananias answers, yes, Lord. He knows exactly who it is. He knows that it's the voice of the Lord. And John 10 says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. The sheep know the shepherd's voice, don't they? There's an interesting phrase in this passage passage that's used to um, 
describe Christianity. It describes it as the way. Did you notice that? It's the way. They don't, they don't use the word Christian. They say that it says that Paul was looking for anyone there who belonged to the way. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? It's actually the most common phrase that they used um, in the New Testament. They use that more commonly than the word Christian. And the way, it's, like, it's kind of a bit like a doing word, isn't it? It's like a path or a journey or like a manner of thinking or feeling or decided, I decided to do it that way. It's like an active thing, isn't it? And it comes from John 14, verse 6, where Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So that's what they used to call Christians, followers of the way. And that word follower, that's active too, isn't it? Not passive. So in, this, in the version that I read, I said in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. But actually in some versions, in some translations, it uses the word follower. There was a follower named Ananias. And that's an active thing. You don't follow someone just by standing still, do you? If someone was walking past me and I wanted to follow them, I would have to move. I would have to do something to follow them. And Ananias knows that being a disciple of the way is an active thing. He has a relationship with the Lord. He recognises God's voice. When God says, Ananias, he says, yes, Lord. And he knows that it's about time together, having a relationship, and he recognises God's voice. Now, actually, the subject of recognising God's voice, we could spend a whole sermon talking about that, couldn't we? Like, it's like a massive topic. But I just want to point out two things that are really important in learning to listen to God's voice. The first one is spending time listening in your prayer life. So sometimes we can come to God, can't we, with like a list of requests. Like, God, I want to pray for this and this and this and this. And it's like we present our list of requests to God. But do we spend time listening? Do we spend time asking God, what do you have for me, Lord? What do you want to say to me? God is your loving father. He has so much to say to you. He always wants to talk to you. If only you will spend time listening. So that's the first thing, the first active thing that we can do to be a follower of the way. And the second thing about recognising God's voice is reading the Bible. This is so important. In here, we have a record of God's voice. There's so much that God says to us through the Bible. And when we're praying and we hear God talk to us, how will we know if it's God's voice or if it's just our inner voice or something else? One of the ways that we know that it's God speaking is because we compare it to what's in here. We go, oh, does does that sound like something God would say? How will you know if you don't know God's word? So we can use the word of God and go, oh, yeah, that sounds like something God would say. And it doesn't conflict with what's in the Bible. So, yeah, that must have been the voice of the Lord. Because God will never say anything to you in prayer that conflicts with his word in the Bible. And it's really interesting, isn't it, that that God gives Ananias these really specific instructions on how to find Saul. That will be important later when we talk about trust. So Ananias recognises God's voice. And we call that prophecy, actually. That's the gift of prophecy. And Paul's first letter to Corinthians says, follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement and comfort. And that's what Ananias does, isn't it? To Saul, he speaks to him for his strengthening, encouragement and comfort. So that's the first thing. He recognises God's voice. And the second point is that Ananias talked to God. Now, that actually might sound like the same thing. We're still talking about Ananias' prayer life. You might think, oh, that not that the same thing? We're on the same point. But actually, I want you to think here about dialogue, not disobedience. If you're taking notes, write that down. Dialogue, not disobedience. So... When God tells Ananias what he wants him to do, go to this house, find Saul, Ananias' answer might sound a little bit to us like disobedience, mightn't it? He says, "Um, Lord, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. It sounds a bit like he's saying, 
Um, God, do you know who this guy is? Um, he's coming to kill me, doesn't it? So that sounds a little bit like a no. Like, um, I don't think I want to do this, Lord. But actually, this isn't a sign of not trusting God or of disobedience. Because it's okay for us to have a conversation with God and to ask him questions. That's what relationship is, isn't it? He didn't say he wasn't going. Maybe there is some fear there, but he just wants clarification. And he's just having a two-way conversation with his Lord who loves him. And God loves to give give us answers. He's not going to get offended or cross that we ask him questions. And when I was reading this, this really reminded me of another story in the Bible. It it might have popped into your head as well. It reminded me of the story of Mary, the mother of Jesus, in Luke 1. You know, when Mary says, "Um, how is that going to happen? How am I going to have a baby? I'm not married. So in Luke 1, verse 34, she says, how will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin. And then the angel answers her, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The angel answers Mary's question, doesn't he? He doesn't go, oh, you're disobedient, you're saying no. Like, she's not saying no, she's just saying, "Um, how is that going to happen? So that's really helpful, isn't it? Mary answered, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. So she was saying, yes, she just wanted to know how it was going to happen. And that's a bit like with Ananias. He's like, "Um, are you sure? Like, Lord, this this person's coming to kill us. And then God's like, no, it's okay. He gives him reassurance, doesn't he? So then we come on to the third point. Ananias trusted God. And we know he trusted him because he demonstrated his trust in his obedience. He went, didn't he? He went to find Saul. And trust is key to any healthy and strong relationship, isn't it? And actually, some of us find it really hard. You might find it really hard to trust other people because of things that have happened in your past. Or maybe you find it really hard to be trustworthy. And maybe you don't have many examples of like, good, trusting, healthy relationships in your life. But it's something you learn in the small things first and then grow in as you get closer to them, isn't it? Trust doesn't usually start with risking your life. Here's a list I found on Pinterest of some helpful things for building trust. Be reliable, even in the small things. Do what you've said you'll do. Cancelling arrangements or failing to follow through on a commitment will undermine the relationship. Keep your promises. Tell the truth. Don't lie to protect someone's feelings or cover your back. Tell the truth, even when it isn't pleasant. You'll become a person known for being trustworthy. Volunteer information. It shows that you've got nothing to hide. When you've got the chance to be vague, don't take it. Be open and transparent. And display loyalty. Be there for that person. Trusting in the big, big things rarely comes in isolation, does it? Often, we trust people in the small things first. And that's the same with God as well. Often, we trust him in the small things first. And God shows us that he's reliable and he keeps his promises. And God's instructions to Ananias, like I said before, are really strangely specific, aren't they? He even gives Ananias a street name and the person's name who owns the house. And then there's a person who's praying. He tells him what Saul's doing. And it's really important for Ananias to have that information because actually then he gets confirmation along the way that he'd heard right. He heard God's voice right and what he's doing is right. So as he gets to the right street and finds the right house, and this is the house of Judas, oh yeah. Like he didn't know that before. God told him that. And so he gets confirmation along the way. Now, our friend who's a vicar tells this story about trust, and it's about his son, Archie. So our friends are in their kitchen cleaning up after lunch, and Archie and his two sisters are out playing in the garden. And Archie's about four and his sisters are older. And they've been doing some work in the garden, like on the shed and stuff. And there's a ladder propped up against the garage wall. So they're doing the washing up. They're looking out the window, keeping an eye on the kids. The next thing our friend knows, he looks out the window and there's Archie on the garage roof. (laughs) So before mum can turn around and see and have an absolute heart attack, 
dad is out there like a shot, right? And he's encouraging Archie to jump off the roof, <laughs> right? Typical dad. He's like, come on, son, do you want to jump? Do you want to jump? So he sees this opportunity. Now, I'm not sure I would have seen it or taken it, right? <laughs> he sees this opportunity to teach Archie some things. Like, he thinks this is a teachable moment. I don't think I would have. He wants to teach Archie that you can take risks like that with permission and that his dad will catch him. His arms will be there. And he wants to reflect the heart of God to Archie. Your dad will be there. Your heavenly father's arms will be open wide, ready to catch you. And he wants to teach him to take risks for God and that God can be trusted just like his earthly father can be trusted to catch him. Yeah, I don't think I would have grabbed that, grabbed that opportunity in quite the same way. But God often teaches us like that too. Small things first. It starts with a garage roof and jumping off. The next thing you know, you're moving to another continent to go and plant a, plant a church, giving up a well-paid job. Like, you never know, right? And actually, when I started preaching about violence against women and telling my own story, one of my friends had this picture for me of me jumping off a cliff and the arms of my heavenly father being there ready to catch me. It's like, you can trust me, I will catch you. And it did feel a bit like jumping off a cliff, I have to tell you. And this encounter actually taught Saul to trust God too, didn't it? Because God did what he said he was going to do. He sent Ananias and he restored his sight. So in that encounter, Saul learns, I can trust God. But also, trust, trusting God, isn't just about our personal relationship history with the Lord. Let's go back to our comparison with Mary's story in Luke 1. Because Mary sings a song after her visit from the angel, and actually it's pretty illuminating. It's called Mary's Song, or actually sometimes we call it the Magnificat, don't we? So part of that, from uh, verse 48, it says, From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in, the, in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. There it is. There's that word promise, isn't it? God has kept his promises through the generations. Mary sings about God's faithfulness to her ancestors throughout the generations, how God kept his promises. She knows that God is reliable because she knows that that's what he's done throughout history. He's kept his promises. And actually, Ananias knew that too, didn't he? Remember, Ananias means Yahweh has been gracious. And we heard in, um, in the second account of the story in Acts 22, Saul said, what did he say? A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. So we know that Ananias knows the history of God's people. So maybe Ananias had stories of God's grace and faithfulness from his own history but also he trusted God because he was familiar with the history of Israel, like Mary was. And then he's become a follower of Jesus, so he also believes that God has fulfilled his promise to send the Messiah. And he believes that God has raised Jesus from the death, doesn't he? From death. So he knows that he can trust God because God has proved himself trustworthy. So Ananias trusts God. And then on to our fourth and final point, Ananias demonstrated God's love in this encounter, doesn't he? So Ananias goes to see Saul and he lays hands on him 
and he calls him Brother Saul. And remember at this point, Saul's blind, he can't see anything. And then this stranger comes into the house. Actually, Saul's quite vulnerable here, especially because he's the one who's been like sending out these murderous threats and, and coming to cause them harm. So maybe he thinks that someone wants to come and kill him and, and stop him from doing that. And then Ananias comes and Saul's in darkness, he's vulnerable. Ananias claps a hand on his back and calls him brother. Like what a warm greeting that is. He demonstrates God's love to Saul. Because Saul didn't know if Ananias was coming in peace. Like he couldn't see his smile, could he? He just feels that physical touch and hears the word brother. And actually, this I think is where we see that this is most relatable. Like we're all called to just one interaction at a time, aren't we? We're all called to demonstrate God's love to each person we interact with, just one person at a time. And this one interaction has a huge impact on Saul, doesn't he? And on the church, because then Saul goes out and and does what God has called him to do. And it all starts with Ananias saying, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Here I am, Lord. What do you want me to do? And we don't really know anything else about Ananias, do we? We don't get much information. Like, we don't know anything about the life, his life before this or the rest of his life as a follower of Jesus. He doesn't appear in the rest of Acts. And so, actually, he is just this average Joe, isn't he? He could be any of us. We don't know his age, his family circumstances, if he's married. We don't know his level of education. Because none of that matters. It could be any of us. It could be any of you, it could be me. We're just all called to this one interaction at a time. And God loves to partner with people in the work of salvation. Ananias was just ready and willing, wasn't he? He just had that, yes, Lord, I'm ready. And I just thought I'd share with you some of... um, some of the ways that I learned to trust God, how, how, the ways that I've learned to trust God in my walk with him, like the, um, the times when God has spoken to me and it's really taught me that he is faithful and I can rely on him. Because sometimes it's really helpful to hear someone else's story. Okay, how did you learn to recognise God's voice? How did you learn to trust him? So there are some significant times, like significant examples of um, when I've heard God's voice in my life and known that it was him, because it would be too much of a coincidence if it was just my inner voice or something else, like it, it had to be God. So the first one I want to share with you is um, when I was grieving. So one of my friends that I worked with, her name was Fiona. She died in the bombings in London, the 7-7 bombings, so 7th of July. Um, And I'd been working with her, and so uh, it was just like that day or the day after, and I was crying in my room. And I hadn't heard God's voice very much. Um, I was in my early 20s. And I heard something just in my head said, read Psalm 10. And I was like okay, that's a bit weird, that's a bit random, but okay. I'd never heard voice, um, God give me a specific Bible verse or passage like that before. And I wasn't really expecting it to be significant, if I'm honest. I just thought it was like my own inner voice, just randomly saying something. So I thought, okay, so, so I looked up Psalm 10, and there's a verse in Psalm 10 that says, the wicked man lies in wait near the villages. From ambush, he murders the innocent. And then it goes on, you hear, O Lord, you listen to their cry, defending the fatherless and the oppressed, in order that man who is of the earth may terrify no more. And so I just really got that sense. God knew who it was who had been lying in wait to ambush the innocent and that he had it in hand, that he would take care of it so that man would terrify no more. And so that was just really reassuring to me. Like I heard God speak. God said Psalm 10. I'd never read that Psalm before to my knowledge. I mean, I might have done, but I hadn't like noted it, you know? And then this is a funnier example. So let's get out of the, <laughs> out of the tears. <laughs> so here's a, here's a funny example. So God did that again. He spoke to me. He gave me a precise Bible verse again. So it was 
this one time when my boyfriend had cheated on me at the time, okay? He had slept with his ex-girlfriend, and I was very, very unhappy about it. It wasn't Paul. No, it wasn't Paul. I was, <laughs> I was, I was very unhappy. <laughs> and I had that little, still, small voice in my head again, saying Proverbs 31, 10. Right. So, so my ex, his, his ex that he'd slept with, her name was Ruby, okay? So I turned to Proverbs 31, verse 10. And it says, a wife of noble character who can find, she is worth far more than rubies. (laughs) And I was like, thank you, Lord. (laughs) And that also taught me that God has a sense of humour, right? I hear his voice, I can recognise his voice, and I can trust him, and he has a sense of humour. And then we were at this, um, like, seminar thing at a new wine festival, And it was specifically on prophecy. And it was basically an opportunity to practice the gift of prophecy. And so they got us to go into small groups. And it was like very much stressed, this is a safe place where you can practice hearing God's voice. And so just say whatever comes into your head. So we were in small groups and um, we took it in turns to go in the middle. And then everyone was praying for the person in the middle. So I was like, okay, so, so we prayed and there was a woman in the middle. And I really sensed God, God was saying something to me about losing a child. And I thought, God, I cannot share this. Like, there are certain things, aren't there, that you're not, that you, well, you have to be very cautious about sharing. So deaths, births, marriages, that kind of thing. You have to be really careful, don't you, and sensitive. And I was like, God, I really don't think I could share that. But it was the only thing I had. And so, very tentatively, I said to her, like, I, I, you know, this could be completely wrong, but I wonder if God's talking to me about something to do with losing a child. I'm really sorry if that's sensitive. Um, and she said, oh, gosh, that's so, like, helpful to me to hear that God knows what I'm going through. Basically, they had um, lost an adult daughter and her husband was not dealing with it very well at all. And um, she just, she just wanted to know that God was with her in that, you know, in her grief and in her husband's grief. Um, And it was reassuring to her and it was reassuring to me that I had heard God right. I had heard his voice and that he had reassured me that it was okay to share that. Now, yeah, you do have to be careful about sharing that sort of thing. Hatches, matches, dispatches. You have to have extra sensitivity, okay? But on that occasion, it was the right thing. And... I would say I was saved at 16, but I didn't really begin to hear God's voice until my 20s, because that's when I actually spent time listening to God and reading my Bible so that I could recognise, well, does that sound like the Lord? Oh, yeah, actually, it does. And so it's something we have to do, isn't it? It's something we have to spend time on. And then more recently, God has called me and my family to step out in much bigger ways, like moving us to Liverpool. So (laughs) about 15, 16 months ago, we moved here. And that was all as a result of God talking to us about Liverpool and then like some really specific prophetic words as well. And then showing us the house we were going to buy. And I saw the picture and I was like, yeah, that's the house. That's our house. But it didn't start with those things. My journey of trusting God didn't start with, off you go, move to Liverpool. That would have been a massive thing. Like, it would have been much easier to say no to that, wouldn't it? If I didn't recognise God's voice and I didn't know that he is trustworthy and that I could trust him. So I just want to encourage you today. Firstly, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, the living God, can I encourage you today to get one? He is trustworthy. You can trust him with your life and he keeps his promises. And then secondly, if you don't hear God's voice as clearly as Ananias did, I want to encourage you to ask, pray for the gift of prophecy and ask God to give you something specific like he did for me with those Bible verses when I just started to hear God's voice. And like the directions to Saul's house, that's so specific, isn't it? It's like that was definitely God's voice. Ask him to give you something. And if you're struggling with obedience because you don't know if you can trust God, I want you to pray for that fear to go. 
that you would know that God is trustworthy and for you and you don't have to fear when he has called you to something. So those are the things that I think that we can bring before God today.